Okay. So good morning, one and all. Happy Monday. Welcome to our newest member, Michelle Morrison. Hello, hello. She joins us from Remax. <laughs> uh, and um, we're very happy to get started into our wonderful contract refresh. So I'm going to share my screen. And let's make this large here. Oops, admit. It's Christina Costa. Okay, so here we go. First, we're going to jump into dot loop. We have our as uh, is contract. I'm going to pull up right here. But one thing I want to point out, first of all, does everybody know? And I'm going to say that because I'm assuming that everybody knows, but that's some, some assuming something makes an ass out of you and me, right? Assume ASS. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, that there is a folder right here, multiple offers. Have we all been there? Have we all found it? Have we all used it? Thank you, Becky, for your honesty. I appreciate you. Because if you haven't, that's okay, because you're going to do it from now on. This is going to be really important. And there's so many reasons we need to go into this folder. So before we even jump into contracts, what is the number one problem we're still having? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you because I see it. Agents don't know what they're doing. It's not even you, right? It's not us. It's the agent on the other side. They don't know what they're doing. So this is a folder that's going to be really critically important, more for the agent on the other side. Multiple offers to buyers. When you have an off opportunity, you have the listing, and you know there's going to be multiple offers, you need to require this. And the reason you need to require this is so the other people know what the rules of the game are. They all think they know. I am seeing agents, my agents, trying to be schooled by realtors who think they know what the rules of multiple offers are. These people don't know. Just because an agent's been in the industry for 20 years, do you think they know what a contract really rules? First of all, 20 years ago, did we have multiple offer situations? No, we didn't. We, the, what we're seeing today is not what we've seen throughout the last 20 years. So it doesn't mean anything. So let's just go through this because I really want you guys truly to understand what multiple offers are and what they're not, right? Now, first off, question, and this is a safe space. I promise I won't make fun of you. And I will promise I won't tell everybody you didn't know the answer. Is that fair? Okay. <laughs> so when you are calling for highest and best, are we allowed to take an escalation clause? Miss Teresa. No. Excellent gold star student. Yes, we're not. That is the have your cake and eat it too situation, right? Here's another question. If we said we're seeing offers, does that mean we're calling for highest and best? If we said on Sunday, we're looking at all offers, are we calling for highest and best? No. no. You actually have to say, asking for highest and best. So you could say, seller will be reviewing all offers on Sunday. That does not mean you're calling for highest and best, right? It's a nuance, but that does mean you can accept escalation clauses. Here's another question. Ooh, this is so much fun for five points. Okay, can you have escalation clauses? Let's say I'm representing the seller, and we have in my beautiful bucket of wonder, three, three offers that have escalation clauses, three cash deals and two financing deals. Can my seller come back and counter two escalation clauses and one cash offer? Can I counter at all? See, I love that though we question. You can, you can. Can I counter, can the seller counter more than one thing? Should he? Yeah. This is the question, guys. Should he? Here's a actual lawsuit that was going on in Tampa that I'm very well aware of. Thank God we're not involved. Oh my God. But true story. Seller countered in writing. Two deals. Sent two verbal written counters back. They both came back at the same time. What the hell are the chances of that? We got it. It was like, boom, lightning. There it is, struck at the same time. Which one is valid? Whichever one you choose. No. Whichever one the law says. They're in a legal case right now. 
This is the problem. So the attorneys have to get involved because the seller, when been writing in a counter offer, whatever comes back executed, normally, right, written and delivered, would can constitute an executed contract because they both came back written and executed at the same time. Who knows which one is valid? But now, you just verbally did a counter. And it's Teresa people. Or what if you put the details in an email, but it's not actually a written executed count? Totally good. Totally good idea. Because now it's upon the buyer's agent to get with their buyer put it in an offer, but when it comes to is what? It's an offer again. Now your seller has to execute it, right? This is a great idea. So my recommendation, if your seller is going to do that to multiple people, you could verbally do it, or you could even put it in an email, but never put it on a contract. Because now you don't ever have to worry about it because the five of them come back, they all come back as offers. Now your seller, ha that's a have your cake and eat it too for your seller. Right, but now we don't have a legal situation. Is everybody clear on that? That's yes, Frank. Yeah. What do you think about um, you know the seller that had verbally accepts an offer? Yep. And by if, if in the meantime that he had not signed or executed, a larger offer came, and then now he said, "No, no, I want to go with this," but he already had delivered to the other agent that he was. Offer. Excellent question. So Fran said, if you guys missed that, what happens if a seller verbally agrees, I'm going to go with an offer, but then in the meantime, in writing, correct, another better offer comes in. Right. Verbal means what? Uh, Nothing. That's why we always write, do not accept or do not pass on verbal offers unless something is in writing. That's whether it's buyer and seller, agent to agent, uh, selling a cow, uh, <laughs> anything in life doesn't matter unless it's in writing. So it doesn't matter yet. Are you going to have bad blood between people? Sure. But it doesn't matter. It, it cannot be held up in the kind of law, law uh, court of law, unless it's in writing. Because it happened to one of my buyers uh -huh. that we sent an offer and they said, oh, can we just, you know, just change the assessment date? Because, yeah. You know. And as soon as we change the acceptance date, we sign it and send it back to you. So we change the acceptance date, we send it over to him, and then the next day he said, I'm sorry, but we got a larger offer. So the the uh, mortgage broker said, no, this is uh, this needs breaking ethics, blah, blah, blah. So you should report to the school. Okay, so two problems. So did you guys hear Fran's question? So Fran said she was representing the buyer. They submitted the offer. The seller said it's great, except change the date in which the offer was valid through. Because right. if the offer is already not valid, you can't use that. Right. So really her offer is not valid. So she had to tend it back, change that and send it through. But by the time she got it through, they already took another offer. Her mortgage broker or the lend buyer's mortgage broker said that that was unethical, that this was not bad. So first problem is you're listening to a mortgage broker. What the hell does a mortgage broker know? Is a mortgage broker a realtor? No. Is a mortgage broker party to the code of ethics? No. Party problem number one. Look who you're listening to, right? Number two, the offer wasn't valid. Your offer wasn't valid because it was already past that date. So unfortunately, timing, right? whatever happened during that period, maybe they held it too long, whatever the case was, right? That's what happens sometimes, right? Th this buyer, the seller had all right to take another offer because you were really outside that window. Stinks, right? But the, the seller wasn't wrong. We don't like him, but he wasn't wrong, right? Yeah, everybody good on that one? Everybody understand that? Yeah. Okay, let's read this because this is gonna answer some of those things we just looked at. Um, I've had people say, a seller's not allowed to counter more than one offer. Really? Let's look at this, shall we? By the way, this is written by who? Was it written by me? No. Was it written by a realtor? No. It was written by a legal team. Who kind of knows, right? So that's why we need to pass this off. Multiple offers have been received. It tells you on which property. And it tells you right here, the seller has requested each buyer to submit their highest and best offer by what time on which day, the deadline. Okay. Offers submitted by the deadline are subject to, they must be in writing, 
right? Very clear. Don't give me any verbal stuff. They must be submitted to the listing agent via email or personal delivery. Please don't come delivered at my house. <laughs> Seller has the sole and absolute discretion. I love that. It has nothing to do with the listing agent to accept, counter, or reject any offer received. Seller is not required to accept any offer regardless of the terms, conditions, and has the right and discretion to reject all offers. So if they don't want to accept any of these offers and continue to keep listing the property, are they able to? Yeah. Just because you said there's a deadline on Sunday doesn't mean you actually have to sell it on Sunday. You know how many agents think you have to? They're wrong, but that's it. After receiving all offers, seller has the right to further negotiate the terms and conditions of any offer. Seller has no obligation to negotiate or communicate with each and every buyer. Well, you didn't communicate to me. You didn't tell, you don't have to. The seller does, the buyer, the seller does not have to communicate or tell every buyer what they want to do. How many people think they do? A lot, right? Seller can make the decision to accept any offer based on the criteria they deem appropriate. Well, my offer was hard. Well, my, it doesn't matter. What, it doesn't matter if the seller just wants some, one that was, you know, by via, it doesn't matter. It's not upon the buyer to determine or worse, it's not even the buyer, it's usually the agent, right? It's about the seller. That's the most important thing, right? In the seller's sole judgment, price is only one factor that may be considered. If the seller accepts the buyer's offer and such offer does not result in a close sale, the seller may in seller's sole discretion reopen negotiations with any buyer. The seller may also request the listing agent to solicit new offers. And you can write in other terms here. Is this nice? This is beautiful. Yes. How do you address it when, the buy, when several of the buyer's agents come back to you and say, can you disclose to me what would have made my offer stronger or what beat out our offer? How much can you disclose? Did you guys hear what Teresa said? I'll share with you. Teresa said, can you, many times the, sell, the listed, the buyer's agent can say, can you please disclose to us, you know, what would have made my offer stronger? You know, what could have been that would have put us just over? How much can you disclose? You know, the answer is as much as the seller will let you, as long as it's illegal, right? Can't have anything to do with fair housing, not allowed to talk about any of that, right? But if the seller says to you, yes, you can share what the highest price is then you can say, if the seller says to you, you can talk about financing, you can talk about that. It's only as much or as little as the seller will allow you to discuss. So that's the, the conversation between you and the seller. How much, sometimes it's good, they want you to disclose it because they wanna try to get more offers and they want, you know, if you have a lot of offers and you're not afraid to lose any, sometimes share all that because you might get better ones. If they don't have a lot, you may not want to share it because they don't want to lose what they have, right? And so they don't want you to know because they want to keep it ambiguous. Just try to see if they get better. So it's really dependent, but you got to discuss those things with the seller. Yeah. What are, what are your thoughts on love letters? Oh, thank you for asking. Uh, Fran asked what my thoughts on love letters are. It's not even my thoughts. It's the National Association of Realtors' thoughts. Um, it is against... Many of these letters are against the code of ethics and many of them are against fair housing. So let's say you get a letter that says, we are so excited to be moving in this home. I can see our kids running down the hallway on Christmas morning, opening up their presents. I just violated familiar status and I violated a religion, didn't I? Two fair housings in one sentence. And if you're the realtor who passed that on, you're the one who violated it. You're party to the fair housing. What? Because I have a seller that was in the listing in a lot. She wants to know the buyer's story. So I would tell you to make it ask her is there a way to the buyers leave the letters in the house? Don't be party to passing it on. If the buyer wants to leave a letter, can they leave the letter somewhere? The buyers can share that direct to the seller. They're not party to fair housing right? I mean, they're not part of the code of ethics. We are. We cannot be the one passing these through. Like, I just have a seller right now, and they sent, like, a love letter, and she wanted to see. I told her, I have it. I'm not allowed to give it to you until after we close the house. That, you know, but I'm just still knowing 
I can't vote for that. You can, and you can leave it at the house. They can mail it to her. They can mail it to the house. They can leave it at the house. Okay. We just don't want to be the one passing them on. If we're passing them on, then we're somehow dragged into whatever that letter says in there. And again, there's so many ways that they can violate it in the, the sweetest and simplest ways. I mean, listen, my kids running down the hallway to open their Christmas presents, right? Very simple sentence. Because you can see a lot of people saying that, right? Two, so, you know, two right there, fair housing, familiar status and religion. Ridiculous, but that is part of it. So the National Association of Realtors is warning agents, right, left and center, do not pass on these love letters. Because if you're, now that one agent who is sharing videos and passing the videos where the families are talking about them, oh yeah. And telling them, telling other agents they should be doing that too. Um, all you need to do is show that to FREC and uh, Fair Housing. That person can lose their license for that. Fair Housing is, by the way, uh, Article 10. That's a code of ethics violation. Fair Housing by itself stands alone. You can have a fair housing violation. And you don't want to get involved in licensure law. You can have huge problems with this. Trust me. So stare clear of that so whoever <laughs> i think it was alex who got that email i mean he thinks he's so smart for having passed that you know video on there was familiar status in that there was religion in that there was one other thing in that one too i forget uh i forget which one it was but it was three i saw right in there code of ethics and from the and fam, uh, fair housing you just don't want to get involved in that messy so but do you guys see the value of sharing this and making every person have to submit an offer with this it's for your protection so when someone tries to school you you can't i'm sorry did you not read the agenda that you attached and by the way the buyer has to sign it so they should hopefully have to get them to read it with their buyer right you really should say buyer's agent but the buyer signing it so that they understand. Now we also have in here, just so you know, one for sellers, so that the sellers understand their obligations in multiple offers, right? This form right here. And they also have the pamphlet of what could happen in a multiple offer situation. Because what you guys don't want to happen is after a multiple offer situation, the seller comes back to you and says, well, I didn't know that. And they blame you. Do you think that seller isn't going to do that? They will. So this is explaining that they can uh, reject, accept. This tells them what all of their rights are. I highly recommend this to them too. Most importantly, everyone thinks that the sellers love them. And I'm going to share a little story because Tammy thought her sellers loved her too. And this is her third deal with the, her. And she was way above the price that we know we can never get this thing appraised for. And she, in five days, got 70000 above that price and worked her butt off, even during her family here, all these things. And then it, they didn't want to put any money in an inspection. There was a little inspection issue. They didn't want to do it, so the deal fell apart. And then he wanted to fire her because he didn't think she worked hard enough for him. Yes. And then wanted to put in a... A complaint against us for not wanting to release the listing and tried to file against me with DBPR for wanting to withhold my contract, uphold my contract. These what this is what sellers become out of greed. By the way, when they tried to do that and realized, <laughs> oh, DBPR likes when we actually follow the contract. <laughs> so then he actually hired an attorney to find out that that's really what the contract says. Yeah. And he realized he was in trouble. Like, this is what you signed. But this is what happens. These sellers had glowing, glowing reviews about Tammy. This was the third time they were using her. So these are sellers that she thought loved her to pieces. So just when you think a seller loves you, doesn't always mean that they're going to always love you. So I think this is a really important thing that you show them. Because you don't want them to go back and say, well, you didn't tell me that I couldn't do that. Right? Because then you could pull this out and go, remember when I gave you this form and it explained it, we talked about it. But whether you explained it and talked about it, could they read? Because you're not an attorney. And most importantly, it's not your job to be their attorney. So never overstep your boundaries 
If they don't understand something, it's their job to get an attorney to explain it to them. Always make sure you never take too much of that burden on. If they don't understand something that they're signing, they should get an attorney to do it, right? So this is a really great form. Now, most sellers don't do that. But just in case that one-off does, you have this. Do you think it's a good idea to get a um, list of house that's like a cheap house that's going to have multiple offers to start off already with multiple? Yes, with always. Thank you, Michelle. Always start off with it. Now, let's look at the addendum escalation because not a lot of people understand this addendum escalation. And I need to talk about how you add it. Now, first off, let's say you're doing whether whichever contract you're doing, you know, I hate the as is, but unfortunately, in many of these deals today, the agents are saying an as is required. Do you think that they're asking the seller which contract you want? Of course they're not, because what seller is going to say, yes, take my home off the market just so they can cancel for any reason. Yeah, that's not happening. But let's go to the end of it. Huh? Hold on, come on. It's stuck. Give it a second. Okay, right here, oh, second to last page. You guys see this other here? When you're putting in an offer with an escalation clause, you must check other and you must write escalation addenda. You have to incorporate it into the contract. If you don't, it's not gonna be included in the contract, right? So if you're going to do an escalation clause with your contract, you check other and you write escalation addenda, right? And then you include this. Now let's look at this. It's a very simple addendum, but I want you to be very comfortable using it. And if anybody has questions, hop in here. And let's just make sure I have nobody who wanted to join. Okay, so we obviously know this contract is made. This is the day it's made between the buyer and the seller and the property address, right? And the buyer and seller parties to the certain contract dated blank which is the same day that you're doing it right and what this is saying is that you date what on the first page of the contract you put whatever price you're starting at so let's pretend the price of the home is 500 just make it an easy price and your buyer is willing to go to 530 right and let's say they're willing to go up in increments of 5,000 thank you this is where you're saying the buyer's offer is increased incrementally 5,000. So that means if somebody put in an offer of 510, your offer is now 515, right? To go to a maximum of, and this is where you put 530. Now, if their highest offer came in at 520, your offer will not be 530. It would only go to 525. And that's where when it comes back to you, the seller would write 525 here. So when you put this in, this is blank, right? This is what gets filled in by the seller if it's accepted. So when you put in the offer, you sign it as the buyer. The seller doesn't sign it. And this is blank, right? Once it's accepted, this is filled in and the seller signs it. We clear on that? Now, the seller has to, to show what the highest offer was. They have to retract the information of the person, right? But they are also supposed to show you the net price, just so you know. I don't know that that's always happening. I'm just going to tell you that. So, because sometimes on the very back, they could say, in under additional terms, minus the da 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 da, right? So maybe there's really, you know, maybe it's 525 minus five. So maybe the net really was 520, right? And you don't know that. So you could ask to see the whole contract. Uh, I would say be weary if you're only getting the front page. Yeah, we might not see whether it's a. Uh, yeah, you won't see if it's financing yeah. or cash. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, you know, you have to kind of uh, use a little bit of your judgment there, depending on who the agent on the other side is. I have seen sticky cases where we knew that there were stuff they were hiding because they only wanted to show like the top portion of the contract. We're like, can we see the whole contract, please? And they're like, well, that's all you needed to see. 
now we know there's more there that we needed to see, right? So uh, in that instance, you know, you can say, no, we would like to see the entire contract because if we're going to use this escalation clause we we have a right to see the entire contract you have to show us with the information redacted see it says that they must show the seller receives from another perspective by the bona fide offer with the computer up with the terms acceptable to the seller which shows the net price so they have to show us okay so that's the important thing and that's what i like about this language in here so this is a good one. Um, there's other escalation clauses that also the Florida realtors have in there as well. So we could use either. But the most important thing is to keep it clean, to keep it simple. They must show us the completed offer. And you just must understand what is the increment that is going up. Your starting price is the first price on the contract. So you don't need to write it here. This does not have the starting price on it. That's where people get confused. It just has the incremental price and the price it goes up to. Everybody good on that? Okay. Any questions on any of that? Everybody good? Okay. Now, everybody quiet on our online. Everybody good? Oh, Ms. Laura Farr, how are you? Doing just fine. Thanks, Carrie. When are you coming back? Probably in about two weeks. Oh, okay. So you won't make our, our cocktails Tuesday. Tomorrow. I, I won't. No, I won't make it Tuesday. We'll miss you. Everybody make it for cocktails tomorrow? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'll find in. Yeah, tomorrow at five. And then we're having our relax and learn here. So, you know, on Wednesday. Okay. So let's continue on. So let's go into the contract. Now I'd like us to go through the financing because i think that is the number one problem that people still are having issues with would everybody agree with that not you guys but the other side whoever we're dealing with anybody have questions this far because everyone's so quiet um here here's to your point this is where fran was talking about if not signed by the buyer and seller to all par parties and delivered on right here on or before if this date is passed let's say this date is what's today april 18th oh my gosh it's the 18th guys can you believe that so let's say it said if it's april 18th but the seller wasn't going to look at it to the 19th if you don't change this the seller doesn't even have to look at it on the 19th it's no longer an effective agreement but if you there are times let's say you turned it in and they were gonna look at it on sunday but then they changed their mind because whatever xyz reason right. that happens and maybe they looked at them all but they're still deciding 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 and the date passes right. that happens too so oftentimes what we do is we just go ahead and change the date and have everybody initial it We've had that too, where they've just executed and moved forward. Then, yeah. As long as we've all executed the contract, we're fine. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's more so going to be an issue if you have multiple offers and the listing agent really is trying to eliminate offers to show. That's usually when it's going to become a bigger issue. Because even today, we're still having situations where there's a lot of offers and the listing agent is trying to cut offers out to not have to show. Terrible, but true. Here's a question. Who's going to play? Uh, does the listing agent have to show all offers if they're valid? What if the offer, your home is uh, $750 and your offer $650? Does he have to show that? Yes. What if so he asked the seller and the seller said, don't show me anything under 700? No. Yeah, love it. Yes, then no. So you, then you could have said, and you could have disclosed, the seller has already told me not to show anything below 700, right? That could be disclosed and you do not have to show anything below that price, right? Again, it's up to the seller. 
which is a good thing because if you start getting a lot of low ball offers, not that we really have that in our market today, but that is something that, so if the seller is sharing those things with you, you can also, now here's one, here's one. What if uh, in the MLS it says, if it's a FERPTA and it says, if the buyer's not willing to waive the withholding, you're not gonna show the offer. Is that loud? I got some nose. Anybody? What do you? What about it? Oh, Barbara Ashley Jones. Hello, ma'am. You're back. Well, I am back. back. You're the world traveler. Yes. <laughs> Happy I to have am you. Back. <laughs> She's been traveling the world. You were just in Dubai, mm -hmm. and Lord knows where else. She, we have to hear from all about it. <laughs> she could be our own consulate. She could tell us everything. Okay. So, what do you guys think? So it it said in the MLS under Realtor Remarks believe it or not, uh, the seller will not, the, the no offer will be shown to the seller if the buyer does not, is not willing to waive the withholding. It, is that true? Were they able to do that? Got a bunch of no's. Anybody think yes? I think they can. I think as long as the seller is Sadly, disgustingly, that is actually allowed. So even that they can do, I know, disgusting. Look at the look on your face. That's the look on my face when I heard that. That is true. So if they disclose that in real term, I said disgusting, they can actually say if the buyer is not willing to waive the withholding for FERPTA, does everybody know what that means? Or does anybody, more importantly, Bram Mahoney, maybe Christine, maybe Kelly, does anybody, Becky, do you guys know what that means, waive the withholding? Yep. Does anybody not know what that means? Speak now or forever hold your peace. I'm just going to share it just because in case you're buying, trying to be quiet. With the FERPTA, if you have a foreign seller, unless it's held in LLC, blah, 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 there's a couple, couple <clears throat> you know, chances. Basically what it says is that the buyer at closing, it's really supposed to be the buyer, but it's really the title company or the attorney who's doing it, they withhold 15% of the gain until the seller actually does their taxes. And then that money goes to pay the IRS and the rest of the funds go to the seller. However, oftentimes, especially when the property manager is the one representing the seller, you'll see they'll say, oh, they don't, they'll waive that withholding. So they look for people who want to live in as a primary residence. As long as the gain in the property is below $350,000, they say, well, we can waive that withholding, meaning they're not going to require the buyer or i.e. the title company or the attorneys to hold that. They're just going to be on good faith expecting the seller to pay. Who wants to play a game and shoot the wheel and expect the seller to pay their taxes? No, they're not going to pay their taxes. So who do you think is going to, you think the IRS is going to say, no worries, we just lost another one. They're not going to pay their taxes. Do you think the IRS is going to be okay with that? No. Well, heck no. Mm -mm. The IRS is never going to be okay with no money. So who do you think they're going to go after? You think they're going to go chasing the seller wherever the heck they may be all over the world? No, they're going to go after the property is what they're going to do. So you can speak to my FERPTA friend, Nina Mullum at Harding Bell, and she will be happy to share with you. Never, ever, never, never allow your buyer to waive that withholding, especially if they're wanting you to do so. There's a reason, guys. If they're requesting you, if they're taking the time to put it in the MLS saying that we're only accepting offers from people who will waive the withholding, there's got to be a real reason they're doing that, right? Don't do that. Okay. Everybody with me on that? Okay. That wasn't supposed to be FERPTA class, but we just figured we'd get into that little FERPTA in there. That, that's happening. It's bad. It's really bad. There was one case, I will tell you, that the, the actual, they bought it in like the 1980s. They rented it out for years. They never even bothered to get an I 10. So, what does that tell you? They never, ever paid taxes. Do you think you have to pay taxes on your gain on rental? Yeah. Yes. Do you think there's back taxes owed on that? Oh, hell yeah. A lot of them. And then, of course, there was gain on the house because you bought it in the 1980s. So, yeah. Uh huh. It would have cost more than the house was worth. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was bad news. Bad news bears. We wouldn't let them wave it though. Okay, so let's look at right here. Oh, by the way, I want to teach you some new wonderful thing I learned about assignability. Really fun little thing we learned about assignability. So with the builder, I will tell you, we, you know, we had an attorney on staff. We, they were like stricter than anything. And we never cared. I mean, if, as long as you had a person who signed first one person, let's say Michelle signed and then Becky signed and then Teresa signed, we didn't care if Becky left and Teresa left as long as Michelle was the, always the person on the contract. We didn't care about the second and the third party. As long as the main person stayed on the deal, we didn't care. So that for us, for assignability, didn't matter because as long as the main person stayed. Uh, apparently not. That is not the case. We just had a deal where we had somebody who was on the case, on the a contract. They wanted to add somebody to help them with uh, financing and it was not assignable. The seller wouldn't sign to add them and they didn't have to because it was not assignable. So they were able to change the purchase price of the contract, $50,000, which was the ultimate gain or the buyer couldn't buy, right? They wouldn't qualify. That's the end game, right? So note to self, always go with may assign but not be released from liability, always. I'm telling you, I, that was a new one on me. I mean, definitely understand changing and putting into an LLC, putting it, wow. but never adding a person. Like, yeah, taking people, but yeah, that was a new one, so. You know, or you can put the name and or signs, but de definitely may assign and not be released from liability. Go with the middle one just to protect your customer. Because in case of a financing situation, if they need to add somebody to a system, apparently it, if it comes down to right now and they're trying to get out of the situation, if you make it assignable but not be released by liability, they cannot say no. That was a new one. And you can want to change my own. That's why we always did it, right? If you wanted to change to an LLC or a family trust or any of that, you have to go with may assign and not be released. And don't ever do the first one because no one will ever sign that one. But, uh, you know, because why would you want to be released from liability? That'd be like, you're going to sell it to Becky and make a quick, you know, 20 grand, which, you know, we used to do back in the day, but no one's going to go for that today. But yeah, be very careful with the main. And by the way, you'll notice, remember back in October when they made the changes, they added, if no box is checked, then the buyer may not assign the contract. So if you just happen to miss that, that could be a really costly mistake because right now sellers do not want to make changes to their contracts. They're trying to look for every way to get out. And in that instance, that would could really hurt you. So, you know, the bad thing about that last one I talked to you about, we were on both sides of that deal. So that was really bad. Yeah. So here we go. Let's look at this financing contingency. Just really break it down and make sure we have no questions on it. Everybody in? Here's the first one. Let's play a little roll the dice. A, this is a cash transaction with no financing contingency. Can I get a mortgage and check it? Thank you. You sure can. Do I have to notify you if I'm getting a mortgage? No. Oh. Now, can I get an appraisal and get access to the property? So this is where we had a situation where we said A, and the person wanted to get access to the property and the seller didn't want to let him in. That's the thing. So we said, listen, it's not contingent. They were afraid they were trying to cancel during that thing. But we were trying to explain to them, listen, there's no contingency for that appraisal. But they were scared because it was during the inspection period. So that was where the, the thing. So you have to be careful to explain. I would suggest if you are going with A, but you are thinking of getting financing just because the rates are still low, share that with the person on the other side so they understand we may get a financing just because the rates are so low because you don't want them to think they're just trying to get an appraisal to see if they can get out during the inspection period that actually happened and it almost blew up the deal but Because they 
well, that's what happened. They could cancel, but really it didn't have anything to do with them canceling because it was just, they needed to get that in in case they were going to get the mortgage. Because remember the time frame is so tight for the appraisal and all of that thing. So they were just trying to see if they could get the money. They didn't necessarily need the money. They could close. They saw that they had proof of funds and plenty of money. It didn't have anything to do with whether or not they were going to cancel. Just had to do with they were going to get the actual financing. But if the, the agent had been more upfront with you about that, you probably would have felt fine. But if they weren't, wouldn't you have been like, well, are they trying to cancel? Right. See, as a listing agent, you were thinking that. Yeah. So to the point, Fran was just like, well, yeah, but they might have been trying to cancel. So as the listing agent, you would be protective. So my point is, if you're on the buy side and that's your situation, be very careful to explain that to the listing agent. Because otherwise that could be construed incorrectly. And you, you know, and it's true. If you can get the appraisal in, if you say no to the appraisal and the appraiser can't get out for another two weeks, then they can't get the loan. We kind of have to work whenever the appraiser can get in there. And it was a problem because it was a rental thing. So that was the only time they could get in. That was the issue. So just sharing that with you. See, and it's funny because you thought exactly like the listing agent did. So everybody understand where I'm coming at there? Just bringing that up because these are situations that we're getting and they're real. And if I was on the listing side, I probably would have thought the same thing. Being on the buyer side, we knew the situation, but we needed to communicate that better, right? So just because of the situation where the market is right now, we have to communicate even better. Okay, here you go. This, now let's look at financing, shall we? This contract is, oh, let's talk about one other thing. Let's say you have a property that has, an original roof. Let's say the roof is from 2006, seven, no leaks, no problems, but we do know that it's hard to get insurance. Right, after 10 years, they won't do it. Well, some companies do, in some areas it's easier than others, right? I'll tell you, Orange County is really tough. Lake County is a little better. Um, I don't know about you, Laura, by your area. I was talking to Dawn. Lake County seems to be a little bit better than, uh, for example, in Orange County. It's really tough. So, And the reason is like in Windermere, for example, you can't go through a community and not see the signs about, what is it called? Like uh, the roof. Yeah. What is that? You know, what? Inspection. Yeah, like they, 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 they give the sue the insurance companies to get your free roof. I forget what they call it, but yeah. They're everywhere. Now, I haven't really seen many of those signs in Lake County, but that's making it so hard to get the insurance in Windermere. I don't know about other areas necessarily, but where those lawsuits have been prevalent is where it's even harder to get that insurance. Have you noticed it in your area, Laura, those signs, you know what I'm saying, where the insurance companies have been yeah. sued in your community too? Yeah. Our neighbors are getting free roofs. <laughs> Okay, it's gonna be really bad in your community. <laughs> yeah. Okay, wherever there are free rooms to be found, it's going to be very hard to get that. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Which community are you in? Uh, the Well, I'm by the villages, but it's called Arlington Ridge. Arlington Ridge. I don't know that there's been any free roofs in the villages because my mom's in there. I haven't seen any of those signs. Yeah. Arlington Ridge the neighbors are definitely getting free roofs. Even the deductible is addressed. Oh my God. Not, not legally, but it's addressed. Barbara, what about you in your area? No, no, no free roofs. roofs. No, no free roofs. What about no. uh, you guys at Windermere? Yeah, eight free roofs. Um, Teresa, what about you? Free roofs? Yeah, and our insurance is from 1800 to 4200. Yep. No, no, where is that? In celebration? Uh, uh, County, uh, okay. Um, County, so Osceola County, not a lot of free roofs. No. What about you? I don't know. Um, I don't think, no, I've not heard of any of our neighbors. Okay. Where are you again? You're up Apopka. in Apopka. So not a lot of free roofs in Apopka. Well, it depends on where you are, right? Okay. Like we're seeing pockets. Right. Yeah. So yeah, they door knocked them yeah, in there too. Well. Yeah. But for free roofs? Well, they're just saying, I don't know. I mean, they're not, they, I don't know if they said free. I remember them just saying, um, you know, we filed an insurance. Uh-huh, yeah. Maybe. So, 
this has been an issue. And so my point is, if you have a home in an area where you see lots of free roof signs, <laughs> uh, I, I hate to say this, guys, but I probably wouldn't open it to FHA. Well, think about that. Unless your seller can afford to put the roof on, right? FHA can't. That probably only have three and a half percent to put down. That means the roof's going to have to go on before they close. So if the seller doesn't have 20 grand or more to put a roof on, you got to ask the seller, do, do you have the 20 grand or more to put that roof on? If they I'll say no. Always have to check your insurance and inspection period too to make sure they can get it. To get the insurance. Well, if you're on the buy side, you have to absolutely have to. But if you're on the list side, so you, these are the things we have to really think about now when we're getting ready to put a listing up, right? You have to ask your seller, do you have the cash if you need to, to put the roof on before it closes? Because if you don't, I would not offer to FHA. You could offer to VA, because even though VA is probably not going to pass that, right? Maybe. But VA is not putting any money down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, Carrie, what do we do with all these waiving contingencies? Appraisal contingencies, they're waiving a lot of Thank them. Thank you. We're going to get to that in two seconds, Ms. Barbara. And I love that you asked that. Thank you. So we have a house. Yeah. Uh huh. So the roof is original, but it's not retained. It's nothing. It's a perfect condition. Yeah. Uh, she has a house in St. Cloud. The roof is. 2007. Uh -huh. uh, but very good. Um, yeah, no problems. And we accept an offer. There was an FHA. You accepted offer. an FHA offer? But yeah. Did they have inspection yet? But they put in 25% down. And, uh, oh, well, they're putting 25% down. That's different. That means they're FHA because they have no credit at all. Right. So that, so that's different. That's okay. You FHA, you're usually FHA for two reasons. You're usually FHA either you don't have any money to put down or you have terrible credit. Right. But the problem is FHA, the inspection is going to come back that you're probably going to need that proof. And if you need the, I mean, you're going to, you may, the inspection may or may not say you need a roof, whatever. But the problem is that you're probably going to need insurance that you either have to pay a lot more for the insurance, but you might be able to get the insurance, right? You may have to pay a lot more. This is the thing you can get insurance. It's just going to cost a lot. So if you say to the buyer, you pay a lot now, but you get your new roof and then it'll go down, right? So they have to have the money to do that. A VA is putting no money down so they could use that money to put the new roof on and then the, it'll go down, right? Same thing with a, a VA, FHA who's only putting 25% down, they have money, right? So they could do it. But if you have three and a half percent to put down, you have no money to have a roof on. That's the problem, you follow me? They would ensure that the guy has a commitment to put a new roof in two years. Yeah, there are companies exactly that will insure it. Style used to still insure it. So Tracy Style's company insures it still. There are companies that will insure it. They just charge more. So maybe that's something we all should get together and put a, together a group of insurance companies that will insure them. Great idea. Right? They, yes, they're going to be higher. But as soon as they change their roof, their rates will go down. Right? Alex has got one. <laughs> so we'll get together a list and put it all together for everybody. I think that will help us all. You guys all agree with that? Dawn has two people. Okay, so we'll do that. Let's all do that. All right, so now let's talk about waiving the appraisal. So let's read through it. And this is exactly one of the big things I wanted to go through, Barbara. So thank you for that. Ooh, let's talk about it. I need to, I don't want to bend my head anymore. Let's read through this sucker. This is a really interesting one. So Buyer will obtain approval of either conventional FHA, VA, or other, which could be USDA, could be buyer's advantage. That's a portfolio program, right? Through our wonderful lender. Um, and you're going to check whether it's going to be fixed, adjustable, right? Whatever. An interest rate not to exceed. Remember, you're going to put a rate there. You're going to talk to the lender. I recommend going either a quarter point, a half a point higher because you want to cap the you know, risk of your buyer, right? for a term of how much 30 years probably but notice here it says the buyer's mortgage broker or lender having received an appraisal or alternate valuation 
So this is what they're saying right here, sufficient to meet the terms required for the lender to provide financing. So that lender's appraisal or valuation must equal the loan that they feel comfortable giving that loan. That has to happen within those 30 days. So they're asking for people to waive the financing contingency. That's your point, right, uh, Barbara? So people are saying, I want you to waive the appraisal contingency. Aren't, isn't that what people are saying? Well, they want you to cover the gap. Well, this all sounds great, only if the lender will agree, right? So if a home costs, let's just say 500, and let's say I'm putting down 20%, let's just do some quick math here. So if it's 500,000 and I'm putting down 20%, that's a hundred grand. So that would be $400,000 loan, right? So let's say instead of it appraising at 500, it appraises at 480. So they want you to cover the $20,000. Well, if the lender allows that, what if the lender says, no, we're not going to give you a loan because your debt to income ratio doesn't allow for you to put down 20 grand? Could be, right? They could say, you haven't shown me all of your assets to show that you have the extra 20 grand to put down because now you don't have the extras in reserves. We only see that you have your 20 grand doesn't mean you don't have it. Maybe you didn't show it to your lender. So they can issue you a denial. So you could write whatever you want to say, I'm going to pay 20 grand up to a hundred thousand, you know, up to 20 grand difference. You can write whatever you want. It doesn't mean that the lender will agree. So Carrie, that makes it very hard for a VA um, borrower when because they're not putting anything down. Not really. The VA borrower is the best one, actually, Barbara, because think about it. The VA has got a 100% loan. So let's, and in their VA addenda, it says that the, the borrower has the right and, and their sole discretion and the, the privilege to put the money down to make up the difference. And they have the money, right? Because they're not putting anything down. So if they're getting a 100% loan of 500,000 and it comes in at five at 480, they have the 20 grand right? Because they're not putting anything down. So really the VA borrower, unless you're in a lower price point where they have no money, but oftentimes your VA borrower is better because they actually have the money to make up the difference. And the VA loan is totally fine with them making up the difference. So truly the VA is so much better. The FHA will not give you the difference. And that's the problem. The FHA says if it doesn't come in at the purchase price, there's no loan. So that's the other problem. You cannot waive this if it's an FHA. If it's an FHA, you're done in the water. If it doesn't praise, it's over. And it stays with the property for things six months. So that's the other thing. But if it's a VA, you actually are better off. Now, if you're at a $300,000 VA loan, they may not have the money. That's a different type of borrower, right? But we have $1.5 million right. VA lenders who are fabulous. These are great borrowers. They have tons of money. They're happy to put up the difference. They just happen to be VA because they served our country, right? And we love them. And they're happy to put the money mm -hmm. down to make up the difference. So I think it really depends, but honestly, in, in truth, the VA is easier to make up the gap because it says very clearly in the VA addendum that they can, right? The difference here is that it said, and it doesn't say that they will be denied the loan. It says that they can. So they already have in the VA addenda, it says if they want, they can back out or they can choose to put the money down. So the VA is set. Right. But in a regular borrower, we just don't know. In a conventional borrower, and you can call the lender, and this is what you got to ask. And you guys got to write this down. This is the verbiage you have to know. You need to call the lender, whether you're whether on the buy side or the sell side, and you need to ask that lender, what price does the home need to appraise at for you to issue a denial? You need to know that, right? Because that is exactly, so whether or not you're going to write this whole thing about you know, bringing the gap and all that stuff, you need to know at what price does the home have to appraise that for you to issue a denial? Because if you're representing the buyer and you're writing all this stuff, you know, it might be good to know that they're going to issue them a denial anyway. 
Sometimes you write all that stuff for nothing. Now, the other really interesting thing is that if your borrower is putting down at least 20% is a qualified borrower is in certain, the home has to be in certain areas, but in multiple cases, the lender can issue a waiver for the appraisal. So if you're on the buyer side, you need to call that lender and say, can you run this property and let me know if you can issue a waiver that you will not do an appraisal for this property. And they um, can give you that in writing. It's actually called, uh, no, it depends. It could be 20. It just depends. Uh, I will tell you what it's called. Uh, Get what it's called. Mm. I don't know what it's called. Um, but it was something where like property inspection waiver or something. It had nothing to do with inspection, though. It had to do with appraisal. However, the key thing is you ask the lender if they can issue that. It's in writing. If they can issue that, you can now write you know, that this, the buyer will waive the appraisal contingency. You submit it alongside with the lender. Now the lender's waiving it. Now you can actually waive that. But if you say you're waiving it, it means nothing if the lender's not going to waive it. Yes. So if the business wants, before we accept an offer, we can like, the offer later. Yes. For their agent to include that. In the office. Yeah, so exactly. So if you're on the list side and somebody sends you that they're waiving the appraisal contingency, you need to call that lender and you need to say, can you give me the appraisal waiver? And if they go, no, then you know it's bogus that they wrote it in there, number one. Then you need no. to ask them, at what price does the property need to appraise at for you to deny this loan? You need to know that, right? And if it was, say, 500 and they say, well, it has to appraise at 500, now you know that that gap that they wrote in there is bogus, too. All this, right. Right? This is the thing. People are writing in whatever they want. They're, they're going, you know, rogue here, writing in whatever they think is going to get them the deal. It doesn't mean anything if the lender doesn't agree. That is the most important thing. So whether you're on the list side or you're on the buy side, this all must be communicated with the lender. You follow me? Okay, so any other questions? One last thing, and then I have to jump on a call with the leadership team. We have a very quick little follow-up on something. But, yeah. Well, you can't supersede what the lender is going to do, right? So you're writing something, that, assuming the lender is going to follow suit, but you don't know right you can't say oh we're gonna waive appraisal you might but the lender's not gonna right because who are you getting the money from you're getting it from the lender that's the difference you know you can't supersede something that you don't have control over that's what's funny right that's the point if you're gonna really waive appraisal and you're really gonna waive that then you might as well just check a and say that there's no financing contingency that is truly the only way to waive financing contingency Right, but they don't want to do that. They just are trying to make you feel like they're waving these things, and they're going to tell you they're going to bring the money. But if the lender tells them, "Well, you can't bring the money because you're not going to be approved for the loan," are they going to bring the money? No. That's the problem with all these people writing this stuff. Now, if the lender doesn't deny them and they've agreed to bring the money, now they're tied in, right? So there is some value, also. It makes the seller feel warm and fuzzy thinking they're going to do it. But are we really sure they're going to? No. Unless you verify with the lender that it's even possible, it's really just, you know, Disneyland. Yeah, it doesn't matter what you write. It has to do with what the lender says, right? Because unless you're the one giving them the loan, I mean, if it's a cash deal, you can write whatever you want because you're holding the money. But unless you're the one who's getting the money yourself, you have to go to the person controlling the money. And unless the person controlling the money tells you it's okay, like the lender's saying, we're going to waive the appraisal, now it's okay. 
right? But if it's not up to the lender, you know, you don't get the choice to say what the lender's going to say. You have to know what the lender's going to say. So you're you're saying, oh, yeah, 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 I'm going to waive it. The lender's going to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm not, right? I'm not going to give you that money, right? That's the problem. That's what's happening. And so the people, it's just like beforehand, okay, you're approved pending the appraisal. Oh, the appraisal came back low. You're not approved anymore. It was kind of the same thing, right? Now it's just happening within the 30 days. But they're like, oh yeah, we're gonna waive the appraisal. Oh yeah, the lender's not gonna waive the appraisal. <laughs> so it's like, it's just at least it's happening quicker. <laughs> That's kind of what's happening. And it's happening within the 30 days. So at least we're clear, you know, but um, also one other thing, I just want you guys to be very aware. Remember in the contract, you must put in writing, in writing, in email, no text messaging, by loan approval period, if they have loan approval or not. If they don't have loan approval, but they can want to continue, then you have to put in writing. We do not have loan approval, but plan to continue. If you do not do that, the seller has a right to cancel for three days. I am seeing sellers get out a lot with this because they call me and they say, Carrie, how can I get out? And I have to tell them. So you must put in writing and it must say loan approval, yes or no. It's part of the financing. It says it right here, right here, right here. Oh, this is so slow. I think I might have passed it. Oh. I said, yeah. no, it's the next page. Here you go. That right here. If within the loan approval period, buyer obtains loan approval, buyer shall notify seller of same in writing prior to the expiration of the loan approval period. If they're unable to obtain loan approval within the loan approval period, and they're satisfied with buyer's ability to obtain loan approval and proceed to closing, buyer shall deliver written notice of same. And of course, if they want to get out, they have to do that. If they cannot or they do not want to, the seller has the opportunity to cancel the contract for three days. See right here. Three days after the expiration of the loan approval, one, line 123. Seller may elect to terminate this contract by delivering written notice of termination to the buyer within three days. And make sure on line 86, if it, they're closing in 30 days, that, that loan approval dates change because if you leave it blank, it's 30 days. Yep. Thank you. So the most important thing, guys, is if you forget to say, and if you just said, oh, things are going good, that does not constitute written notice of loan approval. It must say we have loan approval or we don't have loan approval, but we continue, we're planning to close. Must use those words. Uh, trust me, we've gotten down to that too. Now they cannot cancel. But if they do not say that, they have three days, the following three days that the seller can cancel, your buyer will get their money back, but they're out of contract, they are canceled, and they will move into first place. It won't matter that they just won't get their escrow back. But if the seller wants to cancel, they're out of luck. They can move into first place with the the back of contract or whatever they want, and that's what's happening because the seller has a better deal. Because the, the however long it's taken the buyer to close, they're like, now we have a better deal because the house just went up fifty grand. That's the problem. So it's so much emphasis on the, the buyer's agent to put that in writing. All right, guys, unfortunately. Yeah. But then the condition is still. Yeah. Well, yeah, it doesn't matter. You have to say loan approval, yes, or loan. If it's conditional, then it's not a loan approval. Then you have to say, we do not have loan approval, but we plan on closing. Right, you, but you have to use loan approval in the sentence. Whether you, if it's conditional, it's not a loan approval. Then you got to say we do not have loan approval, but we plan on closing. But now you're out of your financing contingency. So if they don't close, you know, unless you extended it, which I'm sure the seller won't, right? Then you, they lose their money. So you got to let the buyer know that. It, it's it's a scary world out here right now. All right, guys. Well, I hope you got something out of today. Thank you. Good seeing y'all. Bye. 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 All right. Unfortunately.